Warning, the following video contains sensitive imagery of murders committed in Keddie, California in 1981. The bizarre circumstances and anonymity surrounding the case went on to inspire many home invasion horror films, including The Strangers and Cabin 28. Viewer discretion is highly advised. Please allow this video to serve as a cautionary tale rather than reporting it for graphic imagery. You've been fairly warned. The Strangers is a popular home invasion horror film that was released in June of 2008 and spawned a recent sequel in 2018. The director and writer of the film, Brian Bertino, has been quoted saying that the events from the first film were directly inspired by an incident he experienced as a child. Brian says, as a kid, I lived in a house in the middle of nowhere. One night, while our parents were out, somebody knocked on the front door and my little sister answered it. At the door were some people asking for somebody who didn't live there. We later found out that these same people were knocking on doors in the area and breaking into houses. Film theorists have speculated that two major crime events in history can also be credited for inspiring much of the film's atmosphere and scenarios. The first being the Manson family murders that took place in August of 1969. Manson and his family of cultists were incriminated in the murder of pregnant actress Sharon Tate, along with the murder of various friends and family who were present in the home the evening of the break-in. The other historical crime is much more obscure and less referenced than the Manson murders, but is just as brutal and merciless. The Keddie murders took place in the early 1980s and to this day has never been solved. All we are left with is evidence of a cold-blooded series of vicious attacks where knives and hammers were the suspect's primary method of killing and torture. The exact details of what transpired remains unsolved. On April 11, 1981, Susan Sue Sharp and her five children were temporarily residing in Keddie, California. Keddie is located near the Sierra Nevada rural mountains and is known for its isolated location and limited population. In the fall of 1980, Sue had relocated the kids from her home in Connecticut after separating from her husband. The family stayed in Cabin 28 for several months and became acquaintances with another family living in the adjacent Cabin 27. This is pertinent to the story as Sheila, Sue's 14-year-old daughter, decided to spend the night at the Seabolt family cabin the night of the murders. The timeline of the day is as follows. At around 1.30 p.m., Sue and Sheila, Sue's daughter, drove into town to pick up John, Sue's 15-year-old son, and John's high school friend, Dana Hall Wingate. John and Dana were then dropped off near the central part of Keddie, where they later hitchhiked to a party located in Quincy, which is about a 12-mile drive from their original location. It is speculated that a local woman named Donna Williams gave John and Dana a ride to another party they wished to attend before making their way back to Cabin 28 later that evening. Tina Sharp, Sue's 12-year-old daughter, was already watching television at the adjacent Seabolt family cabin before Sheila arrived to spend the night. When Sheila arrived at Cabin 27, Tina began her walk back to Cabin 28 at around 9.30 p.m., never realizing the nightmare her and her family were about to endure. Tina walks into the cabin with her mother Sue, brothers Rick and Greg, and their friend and neighbor Justin Smart. What happened over those next nine torturous hours sounds like a nightmare straight out of a horror movie. On the morning of April 12, 1981, at around 7 a.m., Sheila walks into Cabin 28 after her stay at the Seabolt family home. Inside Cabin 28 were the bodies of her mother Sue Sharp, her teenage brother John Sharp, and John's friend Dana Wingate. The three had been bound by medical and electrical tape and had been either bludgeoned, strangled, or viciously stabbed. Sheila's sister, 12-year-old Tina Sharp, was missing from the scene. In the adjoining bedroom, the two youngest Sharp boys, Rick and Greg, as well as their friend and neighbor, 12-year-old Justin Smart, were found unharmed. They apparently slept through the entire ordeal that had transpired mere feet from their beds. James Seabolt retrieved Rick, Greg, and Justin through the bedroom window. He later admitted to having briefly entered the cabin through the back door to see if anyone was still alive, potentially contaminating evidence in the process. Investigators were called about an hour after Sheila had discovered her family. Deputy Hank Clement was the first to arrive on the scene. He reported blood everywhere, on the walls, the bottoms of victim's shoes, Sue's bare feet, the bedding in Tina's room, the furniture, the ceilings, the doors, and on the back steps leading to the back entrance of the cabin. 
The prevalence of blood suggested to investigators that the victims had been moved and rearranged from the position in which they were originally murdered. The murders of Sue, John, and Dana were notably vicious. Two bloody knives and one hammer were found at the scene of the crime. One of the weapons was the thick steak knife that had been bent in half due to the extreme force during usage. Blood splattered evidence from the inside the house indicated that the murders of Sue, John, and Dana had all taken place in the living room. Sue was discovered lying on her side near the living room sofa and was nude from the waist down. She had been gagged with a blue bandana and her own underwear, which had been secured on her face with surgical tape. In addition to suffering stab wounds to her chest, her throat had also been slashed and an imprint matching the butt end of a Daisy 880 BB gun was found on the side of her head. John had also had his throat slashed while Dana had suffered multiple head injuries and strangulation. All three victims had blunt force trauma to their heads, later determined to have been caused by a hammer. Autopsies undertaken several days later in Sacramento County determined that each victim had died as a result of multiple knife wounds and blunt force trauma. Upon interviewing the Seabolt family, law enforcement found that none had heard any commotion during the hours the crime had taken place. However, another couple who resided nearby reported waking around 1.30 a.m. to what sounded like muffled screaming. They were unable to determine where the screaming was coming from and soon fell back asleep. When inventorying the Sharp cabin for missing items, Sheila was able to determine that Tina's jacket, shoes, and a shoebox containing various tools were missing. Cabin 28 showed no indication of forced entry, though detectives did recover an unidentified fingerprint from a handrail on the stairs leading to the cabin's back door. The cabin's telephone had been left off the hook, the drapes were closed, and all of the lights had been shut off. Law enforcement interviewed several potential suspects, including one man who disappeared from Ketty shortly after the murders and was later found in Oregon. After submitting to a polygraph examination, the suspect was cleared from all allegations. In his interviews with detectives, Justin, one of the surviving boys, told police conflicting stories of the evening, including that he had dreamt details of the murders. Justin later claimed to have actually witnessed the murders and suspects in action. In his later accounts of events, told under hypnosis by Dr. Jerry Dash, a children's hospital psychologist, Justin claimed to have heard unusual sounds coming from the living room while watching television in the bedroom with Rick and Greg. Upon investigating the sounds, he witnessed Sue with two men, one with a mustache and long hair, the other clean shaven with short hair, both wearing glasses. According to Justin's recollection, John and Dana entered the home from the party they were attending earlier that evening and began arguing with two men. The verbal argument escalated into a physical fight that spiraled into violence. Tina allegedly entered the room during the altercation and was taken out of the cabin's rear entrance by one of the men. Tina was never found at the scene and was presumably abducted by the assailants. Tina's remains were later discovered on April 22, 1984, three years and 11 days after the original murders were committed. Her body was discovered by a bottle collector near Feather Falls in Laboring Butt County, a distance of roughly 100 miles from Ketty. Shortly after announcing the discovery, Butt County Sheriff's Office received an anonymous call that identified the remains as belonging to Tina, but the call was not documented in the case. A recording of this call was found at the bottom of an evidence box after 2013 by a deputy who was assigned to the case. The remains were confirmed by a forensic pathologist to be those of Tina Sharp in 1984. Near the remains, detective also found a child's blanket, a blue nylon jacket, a pair of jeans with a missing back pocket, and an empty surgical tape dispenser. Based on Justin's descriptions, composite sketches of the two unknown men were produced by forensic artist Harlan Embry. In press releases accompanying the sketches, the suspects were described as being in their late 20s to early 30s. One stood between 5 foot 11 to 6 foot 2 inches tall with dark blonde hair, the other between 5 foot 6 inches tall and 5 foot and 10 inches tall with black greased hair. Both wore gold framed sunglasses. This led to the now infamous and only known alleged image of the notorious unidentified assailants. About 4,000 hours were spent working the case, but ultimately the evidence all led law officials to frustrating inconclusions. 
The most recent developments in the case happened on March 24, 2016, when a strategically placed hammer was discovered in a local pond and taken into evidence by Plumas County Special Investigator Mike Gamberg. Gamberg also stated that at the time, six potential suspects were being examined. In a 2016 article published by the Sacramento Bee detailing the discovery of the hammer revealed that a local Keddie man named Martin Smarth had left Keddie shortly after the murders and drove to Reno, Nevada. Martin Smart is Justin Smart's stepfather and is theorized that he allowed Justin to live in order to keep the other two boys in the bedroom from coming out to the living room. Of course, all this is theorized and there is no factual evidence of this claim. However, the theory would support and explain Justin's lapse in memories and inconsistencies when retelling the story to detectives as well as his survival through the attacks. From there, Martin sent a letter to his wife, Marilyn Smart, which he concluded with, I paid the price of your love and now I bought it with four people's lives. Marilyn Smart, Justin's mother, claimed in a documentary that she suspected her husband, Martin Smart, and his friend, Bo Boobied, were responsible for the murders of Sue, John, Dana, and Tina. In the same documentary, Sheriff Doug Thomas stated that Martin had successfully passed a polygraph examination about the murders. The use of polygraphs in criminal cases has become increasingly discounted in recent years. It was later confirmed that Martin was close with the sheriff of Plumas County despite the fact that both Martin and Bo had criminal records. In a 2016 interview, Mike Gamberg stated that the letter from Martin was overlooked in the initial investigation and was never admitted as evidence. A counselor who Martin Smart regularly visited would also allege that he had admitted to the murders of Sue and Tina. Martin allegedly told the counselor that Tina was killed to prevent her from identifying him as she had witnessed the whole thing. In April 2018, Gamberg stated that DNA evidence recovered from a piece of tape at the crime scene matched that of a known living suspect. The suspect still remain a mystery and have never been identified. Without a doubt, this unresolved case is still one of America's most notorious and ruthless crimes. At the time of recording this video, 28 years after the events, the case of the Ketty murders is still unsolved.